Welcome back to the Paranorm Girl podcast. I am your host, Kristen. Returning to the show today is medium and author Rob Guttrow. Last time he was on, we talked quite a bit about pets on the other side and the signs and symbols they give us to communicate. Today, he joins me to discuss two books from his Ghosts on a Medium's Vacation series, Ghosts of England and Ghosts of the Birdcage Theater. Before we get to it, I have more information to share about the upcoming howl o fundraising event on October 22nd, hosted by Whitman County Humane Society. For all y'all participating in person, this is a costume party for dogs benefiting dogs in need. That means there's going to be lots of other pups in attendance. So make sure your little woofer is on a leash and is dog friendly. Once again, if anybody missed my first announcement, entry per dog is $10. And to enter them into any of the contests or to get photos taken on site is a $5 donation per activity. Enter your fur baby in cool contests such as the Trick for a Treat contest, the Best Costume, Best Owner and Pet Duo contest, or by letting their inner werewolf shine with the Howling contest. Now... For any of my listeners who are going to participate online, such as myself, you can enter to be considered in any of these contests by emailing your pet's howling video and photos to fundraising at WhitmanPets.org. Entry for the online contest will be $5 per entry, and the deadline for those is 1 p.m. October 21st. How fun does this sound, you guys? I saw a really funny photo because I spend my free time perusing the internet for dogs in Halloween costumes, of Pennywise and Georgie. (laughs) Disturbingly adorable. So if you have any questions or would like more information about this event, uh, check out the website, WhitmanPets.org. And now to the episode at hand. Please enjoy my conversation with medium and author Rob Guttrow. I am so massively excited to be welcoming back onto the show this guest for today. Um, I had him on previously, and we talked at length about a series of books, Pets in the Afterlife, one, two, and three, and we had an excellent conversation then. So I am so excited to welcome Rob Guttrow back onto the show. Today we will be talking about a couple of his other books from his On a Medium's Vacation series, Ghosts of England and Ghosts of the Birdcage Theater. Rob Guttrow, welcome back, sir. Thank you, Kristen. It's uh, really nice to be back. It's so nice to see your face. We're on Zoom today. Yeah, it's, it's great to see your face and be able to talk this way for a change. Yeah. Okay, so Ghosts of England, Ghosts of the Birdcage Theater, uh, which, as I recall, you said it's, it's uh, your number one book on uh, Amazon right now? Um, yeah, it reached number one. Uh, when it came out in uh, in February of 2022, and it's it's been a it's been in the bestseller status for a long time. I'm I'm really happy about that. Oh, that's wonderful, wonderful. Well, I really enjoyed reading both of them, um, and uh, yeah, we're gonna go into depth into both of those. I thought maybe just to start out, just as a refresher for my listeners, um, it would be helpful for to have you to remind us some uh, key differences that we're gonna be talking about today. Um, for instance, like what is uh, what is the difference between uh, a ghost and a spirit? Okay. Um, and well, for those who don't know me, I'm a, I'm a medium, uh, which means I can communicate with people and pets who passed. Um, in my day job, I'm actually a meteorologist, so scientist, so I explain everything in terms of energy. Um, the difference that I have learned about ghosts and spirits is that when we die, the memories that we have of this life combined with our knowledge and our personality, and we are an entity of energy, and we choose to stay earthbound at a fixed location of our choosing perhaps where we died or perhaps where we uh, loved to live at one time. Um, There's a multitude of places you can choose or we cross over and we become a spirit. And that's someone that most people become a spirit. And that means that they can uh, connect with you anywhere, anytime, any place around the world. And the, the bond they have with you is love. And that's how it works. Okay. And what types of energy? I know you cover this as well. What types of energy do both of them feed off of? 
Sure. Well, there's two kinds of energy. One is um, physical energy, and that is heat, light, water, and electricity. And those four facets of energy are things that empower a ghost earthbound or a spirit who's crossed over to get strong enough to communicate with us. There's also emotional energy. Now, therein lies the difference. Earthbound ghosts draw on negative emotional energy, fear, anxiety, depression, and anger, for instance. Spirits of our loved ones, they rely on the love, faith, and hope. So those are the things that empower each of those entities. And you encountered quite a few of those earthbound ghost beings. Um, why might somebody choose to stay earthbound? Well, uh, th there's a number of reasons, actually. Um, sometimes uh, when people die suddenly, they're confused when they awaken as an energy with a consciousness, if you will. Um, and then they linger too long. And for some reason, they get stuck. And we don't know how long that may be. Um, the other, other reasons, they may have unfinished business. They think they can, they can finish as a, an earthbound ghost, but they really can't. And some are actually afraid to cross over. Some, some who have done bad things in this life or think they did bad things fear the other side. And, and that's why they stay behind. All right. And uh, last foundational question, just as a reminder, can you please define the difference between residual and intelligent hauntings? Ah, yeah, good question. So residual energy is really like an impression of an event that happened in the past. And that it, that impression is created when there is a lot of emotional energy. That means good emotional energy, like weddings or celebrations, graduations or, or coronations, if you will, or bad impressions. Um, perhaps um, somebody uh, having an argument or a, a gunfight or something like that. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you for, for that, um, that lesson. Sorry about the uh, basic questions, but it's going to launch us right into this. Let's get into Ghosts of England. First off, I, and I, I, I don't know how to phrase this exactly, but bluntly, like um, these books left me wondering, can a medium actually take a vacation? Because it seems like you were <laughs> on call a bit. Yeah, I, I certainly was. Um, I So I have had vacations where I've been able to block most of them out. And, and I will tell you that when you, if you're a medium and you get sick, um, that, that blocks everything out. When I went to uh, Italy, I had a sinus infection and I, I connected with no one. <laughs> wow. So, oh. Yeah. So, so, so that was kind of a peaceful vacation, although it didn't feel good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You got to kind of like weigh the pros and cons of something like that. Oh, that's yeah. interesting. So when, when you're sick, you don't, you don't experience it, uh, anything. It, it just naturally blocks it off. Yeah, I think my body is, uh, it, it, there's too much going on and I'm, uh, and I'm fighting things. And, I, and I'm just, it's a distraction, really. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, were you expecting just based on what you already knew, were you expecting to have this much action in England before you went? Gosh, no. <laughs> <laughs> that When I went to England in 2012 for the first time, my husband had planned the trip. He is kind of a big fan of Henry VIII and the Tudor period and, and Elizabeth I. And I, that's his thing. I knew nothing about it. So I just said, I said, I said yeah, I've never been overseas. I'm in. <laughs> okay. I love history. Um, <laughs> he planned it with a with a, uh, a tour guide. Um, I think it was across the pond vacations. They, they did a fantastic job. They brought us to places that he, not even he heard about. And everywhere we went, right from the get go, they were dead people calling to me. I know. I can't even imagine. Like, yeah, you were just. I don't want to say accosted, but yeah, they, they didn't really want to leave you alone the entire time. Um, but yeah, you know, one, one other thing I wanted to mention about these books, which I was not expecting, was the history that you yeah. included in it, which is fascinating. And I love Paranormal Meets the History because it gives this whole life to these these people that that you know you don't know, you don't know anything about, and they could be hundreds of years old, and you just don't know that they're they're people, you know? So how much, how much of the history, I know you said you didn't 
how much beforehand, but how much of it did you know before taking the trip? And I only ask because you gave us a lot in the book. Yeah, um, I honestly didn't know much of anything. Um, so I have to confess that my husband was a ghost writer, if you will, <laughs> about, oh. the his- about the history. <laughs> okay, um, okay. So he's, I, I, he has read hundreds of books about, about that period. Again, that's his thing. You know, my, my, my thing is <laughs> you're talking to dead people. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you guys make a good team, two peas in a pod there. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, we do. Um, I, and um, it's always good to be with someone who compliments you, you know, someone who, whose strengths complement your weaknesses. And as, as a matter of fact, one of my forthcoming books, not next year, but the year after is uh, Ghosts of Ireland and Scotland on the Medium's Vacation. And that one's also going to be filled with history. Um, I, I totally agree with you that knowing the history brings these people to life. And it's much more interesting because I, I not want, only want to write to educate people about how the afterlife works, but I also want to educate them about history as well. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Wow. Oh my gosh. I'm so jealous. Ireland and Scotland. Well, that might be part of the answer to, uh, to the question why, um, England specifically like was it just somewhere you always wanted to go did you already know like you know there there's could be some cool spooky stuff you know that you could encounter um I I actually didn't even think about the ghosts to be honest with you I just let Tom Tom's my husband's name I just let Tom put the the trip together based on what he wanted to do and and I just you know I went along for the ride but I have to tell you that we went back a second year and on purpose, because I wanted to go. Um, one of my favorite singers is someone you probably never heard of. His name is Cliff Richard. He's huge in the UK. He's bigger than Elvis and the Beatles ever were over here. And he's still singing at 80 years old. So we got to see him in concert at Hampton Court Palace, Henry VIII's Palace. Oh, wow. That was the thrill of a lifetime for me. Plus, you know, I was also talking to dead people during the concert. So. <laughs> But of course, yes. Um, all right. So there, there's a couple of subjects from the first book, and I, I, I'm just focusing on the ghosts of England. We will get into the birdcage in a, in a minute. Um, but there were a couple of subjects I kind of wanted to, to speak to you about and pull apart, one of which was orbs. You had some experiences with these, um, told some stories about you know these being captured. And the paranormal community seems a, a bit split on this subject. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on them, about them? Uh, What were some of those pieces of evidence captured during your visit? I think that um, orbs, genuine orbs, can be the embodiment of a ghost or a spirit that doesn't have a lot of energy. But in my experience, it has to have a uh, colors and designs in it um, in order to be considered an orb. Uh, That's just my experience. And often I have found faces in them. Anything that's a white ball of light is often a reflection of dust or pollen or or uh, rain or mist or something like that. Okay, um, something kind of cool. You mentioned f- seeing faces in them. Uh, you included a photo with the ghost in the doorway story. I think it was, and there does appear to be a face in one of the orbs. I I, I zoomed in on it for some reason. I just felt like let me zoom in. There looks like there's a face in there. And I don't know, I can't, I don't remember if you mentioned like uh, catch, you know, catching that or not, but I, I, yeah, every, anyone who uh, is reading this book, you know, take a, take a look. I got it on ebook. So I was able to kind of take a close look at that. That was so cool. And, you know, honestly, I can't remember where that was. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, These are just random thoughts I had going through, uh, through the book. So yeah yeah i know a lot of a lot of folks really just want to jump on the bandwagon that it's just dust it's just a reflection but you know i've seen some pretty convincing photos and uh, they always seem to appear in these places and and in these situations where there seems to be some other activity going on so in my my opinion it's just supportive you know yeah so usually what uh, one of the other ways that i i prove that an orb is an actual entity is that if I walk into a place, I can't see them usually, but I will ask somebody to take pictures and, and sometimes they will show up. Um, when, I, when I went on a paranormal investigation here in the US, um, where it wound up 
being a double murder ghost investigation. Um, the, the room in which I sensed one of the uh, two women who were murdered there had an orb. And as we zoomed in, um, we could see the face of one of the women. And uh, that is, um, that's on the cover of my book, Lessons Learned from Talking to the Dead. Whoa, whoa. Yes, it was creepy, really. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That gives me chills thinking about that when you think it and then and then you do get that uh, that proof, you know. Um, mm -hmm. That, you know, that brings up an interesting question. Can people see orbs with the naked eye? Is that a possibility? Yeah, they, they can. Um, I, I think it's 50-50, really. Um, I, I have not seen one, but I do know, uh, I do know some people have. Uh, uh, one woman sent me a, a video of an orb uh, that came flying in her room after she called the name of her dog who had passed away. And, and the orb circled her bed like her dog used to. And then she said, okay, you can go in the other room and sit down. And the orb zipped away and went in the other room and disappeared. So she knew it was the spirit of her dog. Oh, wow. Wow. Um, oh my gosh. Okay. Uh, <laughs> something else I, uh, I wanted to discuss with you um, because it, it actually has to do with the subject that I'm covering this season, all about psychics and mediums. Uh, I, I covered all of the Claire senses early on. And as I was reading through, what was uh, really interesting to me was that you didn't just experience these things using just one of your Claire abilities, like just clairvoyance, just claircognition. Um, I was curious if you generally think that mediums are going to be naturally stronger in one sense over another, or do they have access to all of them equally? I think that we all have different levels of, of a gift. Um, so some are more strong than others. Um, I've, I've spoken to some mediums who can hear them, <clears throat> but have not seen an image of them, uh, of ghosts or spirits in their head. Um, so it, yeah, I think that everybody has different levels of abilities. Okay. All right. So there were some stories that you included about ghostly children. Um, as I recall, there was some, one about a, a couple of princes and one about a young girl in a shop. Um, it's, it's not something that most people would like to imagine that any child would remain earthbound as a ghost. What, what's your opinion as to why that could be the case? Um, I think that sometimes when, uh, when young children are m murdered, um, and they, uh, they wake up confused more so than adults on the other side, well, as an entity of energy, and they don't know what happened to them. And I think that's what happened. And, they, and these two princes that were supposedly murdered by, I think, Richard III in the Tower of London, uh, because he wanted the throne, and they were in his way, really, of the throne. Um, that's why he had them kidnapped. And uh, um, there are a lot of, there's a lot of conflicting history about this. But the general consensus, I think, is that that's what happened. And, and I think that they woke up as energy entities, and they were confused, and they just stayed there too long and they got trapped. Yeah, it's very sad. Yeah, yeah, I was just thinking about that. Like, I, I know, I, and I've heard it on other shows too, that, that people like to think that, you know, like, like an innocence like that at a certain age, um, you know, if they go like that, then, you know, they're naturally easily like whisked off, but, but it makes sense that, yeah, they, they, they might be confused and not know what's going on and, and, you know, mm -hmm. um, have that aspect to it. So, there was an exception, though. Um, mm -hmm. One of the ghosts that I did encounter was Henry VIII's wife in Hampton Court Palace, um, fourteen, the fourteen-year-old, um, and her name just jumped out of my head. <laughs> 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 um, so she was. Uh, it was Catherine Howard. That's who it was. So Catherine Howard was accused of being uh, of playing around on the on, on the king. Now, Catherine Howard was 14 when the king married her, and he was, I think, in his early 50s, you know, so. Oh, yeah. olden times, right? <laughs> yeah, so, you know, it's a 14-year-old girl. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> She's attracted mm -hmm. to, to boys her own age. So um, so he had her, her killed. And in Hampton Court Palace, there is one particular hallway that um that she haunts and she haunts that on purpose so she because she was unjustly she figured she says she was unjustly killed 
um, by Henry VIII. She is still running up and down that hallway screaming for Henry VIII to spare her life. And she wants it to be, she wants it to be different. Of course, it never will. But she decided to stay there earthbound, trying to change her fate and come back. And I ran into her. Um, as a matter of fact, when I walked from the king's chamber, uh, the the draw the watching chamber, into this hallway, I didn't know what had happened there. Again, I knew nothing about Hampton Court Palace. I walked in there and suddenly I heard a woman screaming and she ran right through me. And I, I was totally chilled to the bone. She took all my energy, the energy, the warmth of my body and took it. And I thought, what in the world just happened here? <laughs> you know, and I'm listening on headphones and it's ta still talked about the previous room. And then it, it caught up to me and it said, Catherine Howard's ghost has been spotted in this hallway she's often been screaming or she stands behind the curtains and touches people. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, <laughs> thanks for the heads up. <laughs> what did your tour guides think of? Like, like, did you mention when these things were happening as you were going through and like, like say out loud? Um, well, in, in Hampton Court Palace, I had an audio tour. So it was oh, just the okay. headphones. Thing. Okay. <clears throat> but I, I did, of course, tell Tom. <laughs> And he's like, oh, okay, yeah, I, I, I knew about, uh, I knew about this hallway where she was, she was told of her execution, her uh, forthcoming. You know, um, did you do any, um, like, like work with the spirits, the, if they were intelligent, like, did you do any, make any attempts to cross them over while you were there? Was there, was there just not enough time to do that? Um, no, I did not. I did not cross them over. Usually, if they approach me and ask me for help, I will try and do that. Um, it, it depends on their personality and it depends on their desires. Again, this was 2012. It, it was 20, 2011 when I joined the, the ghost tracking group and I was crossing people over for the first time. But these cases were so startling that, you know, they just came out of nowhere <laughs> and then they disappeared. I mean, she, like I said, she ran through me and she ran down the hallway. <laughs> I was like, um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, there was one other, what was it? Oh, you talked about, I think it was the salt tower, salt tower oh, story. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. Tell me about portals. Yeah, that, that was weird. That was my first experience really with a portal. So a portal, a portal is a doorway of energy that a ghost will use and to move from one part of a structure to another part of a structure. Um, I encountered that in Maryland in the mansion. There was a portal on the second floor of this mansion. And the, the other portal opened up in the middle of the cemetery behind the mansion. And, and we found that out because we both, we, we, myself and another medium, both got the same sensations. We got tingling and uh, numbness and coldness in, in both spots. And we realized that the ghost um, will open a portal of energy because they are energy if they get strong enough and they'll use it to just jump from one place to another. And as we walked into the salt tower, now the Tower of London is composed of uh, a number of towers. In these towers, really all that's in there are a couple of signs and a light bulb and that's it. So we opened this giant wooden door to go in the salt tower and as we touched the door, we heard a loud humming and it was bizarre. And, and we looked at each other and we said, what, what do you think that is? That sounds like an electrical uh, overload or something. Mm -hmm. So we opened the door and we started to walk through and it was just a tingling sensation and a loud humming, almost like a truck humming. And then as soon as we got in, it disappeared. So what I what I figured out is that that was a portal. There was actually a ghost waiting in there for some reason. And he had he or she had just gone through the portal and the portal was closing as we opened the physical door and walked in. It's craziest experience ever. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know much about them. So that was really a, a fascinating story um, and experience. Is it so you were saying portals, ghosts use portals within the same like structure or area. So it's not like they can, you know, be a ghost in, in Africa and then suddenly, you know, jump to Antarctica or something like that. 
No, yeah, <clears throat> that, that's it. It's it's very limited to only the structure in which they choose to inhabit in their Okay, app. okay. Yeah. Can they ever um, travel without the use of one? Um, it's very rare and very limited, but they they can if there's enough energy attach them to some some someone attach themselves to someone. Okay. Um, <clears throat> that only happened in one one instance that I know of. A ghost that was at a hospital attached herself to one of the members of the inspired ghost tracking team who was headed to the paranormal meeting that night and uh, we wound up crossing this woman over so uh she had died there in the hospital in childbirth and um that's why she was there she was looking for a baby who, <clears throat> who had also died in childbirth um but she attached herself because she she read the energy of the person and she knew that that person could likely help her and that's what sometimes ghosts will do. Um, actually, there was a second instance. Um, in my book, Case Files of the Inspired Ghost Tracking, we went into a home where uh, a nurse and her husband were reporting uh, weird things going on and the shadow figure. We didn't know she was a nurse, <clears throat> but this ghost revealed herself uh, to me. Um, and she she had burns all over her face and she had... Uh, this is kind of graphic, but an earring melted in her ear oh. and it, she was obviously caught in a fire or an explosion. And when I mentioned this to the, the, um, the wife of the, the house, she said, that's when she said, oh yeah, I'm a nurse at a burn unit. And she said, what does this girl look like? And I described her and she said, I know who that is. And she called the hospital. She called her nurse's station there. And she talked to somebody and they got the woman's name and I was able to look her up on the, uh, on the internet and I found the accident and it was exactly as she described it to me. And uh, it was just, it was heartbreaking. Uh, so this ghost attached herself to a nurse mm -hmm. because the nurse gave her so much love and care at the end of her life. And the, the ghost um, knew that the nurse would help her cross over. <sighs> Wow. Yeah. Tragic story. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, you, you didn't, uh, you didn't bring any attachments back with you, did you? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> okay. Well, good. <laughs> oh, that is, that's, you know, that's so tragic. Um, I, it's good to know because it's such a sad thought that, you know, these intelligent beings are stuck, you know, and, and, uh, you know, for hundreds of years at a time, uh, sometimes um, that they, you know, they can still figure out ways, you know, to, you know, can, you know, somebody can help me, here's a medium, here's somebody who's sensitive, you know, maybe, you know, let me, let me try to, to get myself out of this. Let me try to get help. That's, um, that's a little, little reassuring because, you know, the whole subject is very sad. The worst part of that, of thinking about this is that if these ghosts are lucky enough where they run into someone who's sensitive, that person can help them cross over. If they're not, they're stuck there for eternity. Yeah. yeah, it's, you know, I can't even imagine eternity. We can't conceptualize that in our <laughs> human brains, but it's a long time. Mm -hmm. um, you, uh, you also talked a bit about literally feeling the pain of death from these intelligent hauntings. Um, I was curious if you have also felt something similar or, or do you feel something similar with residual hauntings? Uh, no, with, with residual hauntings, I, I don't feel pain of death, but I, I do feel either happy energy or uh, bad energy. And yeah, and I, in England, um, one of the most startling things was I, I felt a sword go through my shoulder and it, I actually, it made me buckle at the knees and fall on the ground when I was walking through one of the palaces. <laughs> and Tom looked at me and he said, are you okay? What's going on with you? And I said, oh, some dead guy just decided to, you know, swing his sword right through my shoulder. <laughs> I had to feel it. Now you do. Oh, lucky yeah. you, Rob. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, well, why don't you, uh, what was um, maybe like the most memorable, you know, encounter that you had or most profound, some, some, one of the stories you want to share? Well, there, there are two of my, fa there are two actually favorite ones, but, um, you can tell them both. I don't, you know, we got time. Okay. All right. Well, <laughs> so there was a place we went to, to 
Westminster Abbey. Have you ever been to Westminster Abbey? No, I've n- I've never been to to England. Period. Oh gosh, you need I, to go. I would love to go. So when you go, take my book and the, you see what you sense. Really? <laughs> okay. Okay. People are actually buying the book as a tour guide. <laughs> so I can see. I can see why. Uh, absolutely. Which is pretty cool. Um, so we went into Westminster Abbey, and Westminster Abbey has been around, been around rather, since uh, 1099 AD, I think, since mm-hmm. William the Conqueror's time, um, and or 1066, sorry. And there are kings and queens buried in there, and I think there are like 3,000 men and women that are interred in there in some form or shape, um, whether they're um, you know full body or some other way. Anyway. Uh, he, oh, Charles Dickens is actually buried in there, by the way. Oh, very cool. Yeah, that was quite a surprise. Um, so Westminster Abbey is famous for a haunted monk. And I met him. He's quiet. <laughs> I'll tell you that. <laughs> um, but what's interesting is that before we got into Westminster Abbey, he never had experiences. He, ne- he didn't have any feelings or anything. We got into Westminster Abbey and it was like an explosion of his uh, abilities. He became sensitive to figure out, to, to sense ghosts. And what happened is we were near one of the burial chambers of the, one of the kings. And he said, there's a, there's a male ghost here. And I think it's this king. And I walked over and I could sense a man standing there in the shadow behind the, the monument. And um, I said, yeah, there is. I said, how do you know that? He says, well, I smell, it smells like a rotting corpse in here. And so that became his hallmark sign of identifying when there was a ghost around him, which to me is disgusting. (laughs) Just just always smelling rotting corpse? Yeah. Ooh, yikes. I usually get a headache. I'll take the headache. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, right? So we get to one of the places we stopped at was the uh, the tomb of Anne of Cleves. She was the queen of England and she died in 1557. So in front of her tomb, we were standing about 20 feet apart from each other. And we were looking, both looking at her tomb in the same direction. And suddenly our hair was pulled. Mine, mine was pulled on, uh, on one side. His was pulled on the other side, both facing each other. It was as if someone had arms 20 feet long that pulled our hair at the exact time because we turned around and looked at, looked at each other. And I said, somebody pull my hair. And he said, somebody just pull my hair. That was astounding. To me. <laughs> I think she had help. But, um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> very long arms. <laughs> yeah. Very. Yeah. The long arm of the law. I guess. <laughs> so that was my fascinating story in Westminster Abbey. There are many more, um, things in there. But uh, the other one that I'll, I'll just mention briefly is um, Heaver Castle. I knew nothing about Heaver Castle. When we got to Heaver Castle, we went in. Um, and as soon as I walked in, there was, uh, there, was a, there was a man standing behind me, a ghost. And he said, hello, my name is George, <laughs> in the British accent. Mm-hmm. And I thought, okay, hello. <laughs> <laughs> You're not there. <laughs> um, so I, I turned to Tom and I said, um, does it make sense for anybody named George to be living in here? And he said, yes, of course. He said, this is the home of the Boleyn family, Anne Boleyn. George was her brother that was executed with her at the same time. And George, this never happened really again, but George walked with us throughout the entire castle pointing out places and things that he experienced in his life. And uh, when he was most proud of Anne Boleyn, he gave me the year and I had to go home and look it up. It turned out that was the year she got her first royal title. Uh, you know, and I couldn't know any of this. Right, right. <laughs> so we had a ghostly tour guide in the Hever Castle. Uh, so did you, when you said this never happened again, like, do you just mean with, with George? Like, did you go back there and you didn't experience him again? Or, or you've just never had that experience again? I've just never had another ghost offer to tour me around their home. <laughs> Wow. First class treatment. That is wonderful. Yeah. You know, I wanted to tour, ta- uh, turn to the uh, the tour guide and just say, you know what? We don't need you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Talking to a dead guy that lived here. In the- <laughs> in the- 
Yeah, well, you had so many fascinating encounters and stories in that book. So everybody is just going to have to read it. Um, please do, because uh, it's it's such a, a great story, great book, uh, great vacation. But now um, I do want to get into the Ghosts of the Birdcage Theater, Tombstone, Arizona. Uh, what drew you to that location? Um, it was in 1993 that I saw the film Tombstone with Val Kilmer and uh, Kurt Russell. Did you see that movie? Yes, I did. Oh, Val. Mm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and Kurt. Yeah, and Pretty Kurt. Handsome yes, guy. yes, yes, he was. Yeah. <laughs> So when I saw that movie, there was something oddly familiar about that, mm -hmm. and I couldn't put my finger on it. Uh, but I was really drawn there. I was re re really just drawn right into the whole thing. So I asked a friend the next year if he would go with me to Tombstone and, so we could visit. And he watched the film with me, and he was like, yeah, that sounds like a cool place. Um, you know, it's a town preserved exactly as it was back in the 1880s. Um, so... Uh, for the folks who are not familiar with Tombstone, it was a mining town that was founded in the late 1870s by a miner named Ed Shefflin, who was looking for silver in the deserts of Arizona. He struck a load of silver and a town was built around it. When he struck the load of silver, he named the, the strike Tombstone because he worked at Fort um, Hachaca, which was in the area. And other soldiers said, you're going to not you're not going to find anything out there in the desert. You'll only find your tombstone. <laughs> so he called it tombstone. That's how tombstone came to be. So the town, um, the town started, re was really up and in, in running in eight, by 1881. By 1889, the silver mines all flooded when they hit underground water. The town shut down. So when we visited in 1994, I, I have to take you back here, though, because in 1994, we have to remember, there really weren't any cell phones. Computers were only the typing the letters on the computers, <laughs> on those CRT screens. So there was no way to get information about Tombstone unless you went to a library that you may have just been fortunate enough to get a book about. You know, there was no Amazon.com. There was nothing. <laughs> so it was like living in the Stone Age. <laughs> it, it was a different world. I do remember. Yeah. So we went out there and I told my friend I wanted to have some fun. And um, I said, let's let's go out there dressed up. I'll dress up as Wyatt Earp. You dress up as Doc Holliday. <laughs> and we'll go see the town. And he was like, okay, that sounds fun. And so that's what we did. Is that is that the picture that's on the front of the book? It is. Yeah. That is <laughs> okay. Dressed up as Wyatt Earp in 1994. <laughs> Okay, sorry to interrupt. Please continue. No, no. <laughs> so, so there's a picture in the book about me of me and my friend mm -hmm. um, standing in front of the tombstone epitaph, which was the one of the two newspapers in the 1880s. Um, so, so that that's one of my favorite all time pictures of my life, really. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, here's what started to make sense back in 1994 we started walking into the town. We were we had parked at the very end of town in a parking lot near the Birdcage Theater, which is really at the end of Allen Street. That's really marks the end of the town. We walked past the Birdcage and somebody came up to me, both of us. And they thought we were part of the reenactors who put on the OK Corral shootout every day. And they asked me for directions to the courthouse the uh, 1880s, 1882 courthouse. Mm -hmm. And without flinching, I just told him where it was. I said, you go two blocks down, you take a left, you go one block down, you take a right, and, and it is one block on your left-hand side. And my friend looked at me and he said, what in the world did you <laughs> just say? And I had to think about it. I'm like, I don't know. I, I don't know how I know that. So he said, I bet you gave that guy bum directions. So we're going to go follow your directions. And he <laughs> did. I, I have to tell you, the courthouse was right there, exactly where I gave directions. You just knew. And I knew, and I, I, I didn't realize this until much later. I mean, like <laughs> two decades later, that that was indicative of me living at that time. That was my past life. That was uh, one of my favorite parts about this book uh, was your discovery, how you discovered uh, this, this past li you know, life and, and sent you on this, on this path. I am so glad you told that story. 
Um, have you dabbled much in, uh, in past life regression or hypnosis, anything like that? Um, just once. Um, and, and actually it confirmed that I was a minor in, mm -hmm. in Tombstone in the 1880s and I had a hound dog and I lived in a wooden, small wooden cottage. Um, and that's what came up. And I described everything I was wearing. Um, what about you? Uh, you know, I, I did one time do like a, like a self <laughs> regression hypnosis and, uh, you know, I can't confirm absolutely 100 percent but yeah i did have this very strange experience like a like a like a just a, a quick vision of um you know like like may a cow, cowboyish you know walking down an old western uh street and like the details of the flickering lanterns on the front of the store mm. you know the stores and and the whole boardwalk and and just looking down and seeing scuffed up boots walking down this this dirt street so you know cannot confirm cannot deny but um it was very strange but that's that's the only one that i i have had personally i guess that i can look to but yeah the whole the whole concept of past life regression and and looking at you know what could happen or incarnation that kind of stuff um is is really fascinating to me it's one of my favorite subjects to talk about so tell me what state are you most drawn to because that would indicate what where that may have happened oh man you know california has always been the place and uh okay. yeah i did live there for for a decade of of this life but um yeah i've always been drawn to california okay yeah. well i can see that yeah um <laughs> by the way uh white arp's older brother virgil uh, retired after losing the use of his arm and he became a sheriff in mm. california huh. um yeah near San Bernardino. I actually went out and I saw his house it's still standing. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, I I've been through, cause I used to live in Montana and, and I had the opportunity mm -hmm. to go through quite a few ghost towns where it is the, you know, nobody lives there anymore, of course, but, but they restored it. And, and when I like keep it as part of their, their historic, you know, natural history. And so the original structures and everything, old school houses, and there is just something, palpable about that energy walking into like just stepping into the past it's just very i don't know visceral like i love love history love historical structures awesome well yeah. um that obviously you lived at a time when you experienced that firsthand <laughs> obviously well all right enough <laughs> about me let's get back to uh your experiences here who who were some of the entities that you encountered specifically in the birdcage theater? There were many types of, of actually uh, of entities, many types of, of people, I should mm -hmm. say. Mm -hmm. um, there were actors, um, there were um, gamblers, there were uh, prostitutes, there were minors, there were uh, drinkers <laughs> who were patronizing the saloon. Because the Birdcage Theater was really a hub of activity. Mm -hmm. uh, it, there were four things going on there all the time, 24 hours a day. There, there was, of course, performances, um, scheduled performances. So those weren't 24 hours a day, but where they had music and they had magic acts and um, readings and all kinds of things going on. There's also a big bar, a big uh, bar that they had shipped, ironically, from Pennsylvania. It was made in Pennsylvania. And it had to be shipped by barge. They had to get it out of Pennsylvania, ship it by barge all the way around the country to Arizona, mm -hmm. which was crazy. Yeah. Um, so there were, it was also a, a house of ladies of the evening, if you will. Every woman who worked there, um, and this was a profession back in the 1880s, mm -hmm. um, everyone who worked there had their own room, and they used to call it a crib, if you will. Um, and finally, it was also a big gambling place. In the basement, there were several gambling tables set up and they had poker games continually from 1881 to 1889. It, as a matter of fact, yeah, and it was 24 hours, seven days a week. Mm -hmm. And it lasted for um, uh, eight years, five months and three days. The, the, the game itself. The, yeah, the poker playing. So yeah, and it was continuous for eight years, five months and three days. And wow. what would happen is um, 
it would they would charge a thousand dollars in the 1880s money, which is thirty thousand dollars today, a thousand dollars to get in to play. And then once you lost all your money, there was always somebody waiting to take your seat. So that led to some uh, pretty intense residual energy. Okay. We talked about that earlier, but um, yeah. but it was fascinating because when the bird the birdcage opened um, officially on Christmas Eve, I think it was 1881, um, it clo- and it closed in 1889. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it was December 24th, actually, that it officially opened in 1881. Um, when it closed in 1889, they just left everything the way it was. There was money and chips and everything and cards all over the tables. That town shut down very fast when everything flooded. Everybody wanted to run out. So you can see all that today. I mean, you, so the birdcage has, uh, they have tours during the day. So you can go walk through the birdcage and you can see all the history. They have explanations and so forth Mm -hmm. about what what you're looking at. Everything is preserved exactly as it was in the 1880s. It's a walk through history. Any uh, any plans to revisit it, to go back, do some more investigating? Well, I actually did. Back um, in May of 2022, I went back for uh, for four days and I did a book signing for the, the book, mm-hmm. The Birdcage Ghosts. And I went on a ghost tour again because two of my friends drove over from California and they wanted to do it. So I said, okay. Um, I met a couple of the ghosts that I met uh, in 2019, when I wrote, you know, when I started putting the book together, mm-hmm. and and then I met a couple of others who decided to come out that didn't come out back in 2019. So I will say, in, so the book is written from my experiences in 2019 when I went to visit. I actually asked a friend of ours who lives in Phoenix to take a tour with me, you know, tour me around uh, Southern Arizona, and mm-hmm. I said. The Birdcage Theater is really cool, and they now have a ghost tour. Would you like to go? And he said, yeah, I sure. I don't you know, really know if I believe in ghosts, but I will. He saw two of them. <laughs> saw two of them. <laughs> and that's in the book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So he was quite surprised. And, and he said, you know, I, I'm kind of open-minded, but I didn't, I certainly didn't expect to see two of them. <laughs> So he believes now, yes? He does. Oh, good, yeah, good. <laughs> All right. Well, were there any uh, uh, final stories about the birdcage you'd love to leave us with before we move on? Sure. I can tell you a story about um, a, a ghost that is not in the book that I encountered in May 2022. Oh, so yes, this please. Is, <clears throat> so this is kind of a, <clears throat> a bonus. Um when I went on the ghost tour in 2022 with my friends from California, I came downstairs where the, the gambling is. And um, there was a ghost that, <laughs> that shot me against the wall on, in the corner of the stairs. And he's in the book. And I actually sketched them out. So for, <clears throat> for the folks that are listening, when I see a ghost, sometimes I sketch them out. So I, I think there are five sketches in the book. Um, but I ran into another guy in the basement. I was standing kind of near the poker table area and near the first crib, if you will. And as I was standing there, suddenly I felt a bullet go through my lower back on the left-hand side. And I actually was pushed into the wall face first. The tour guide is behind me and she's going, what happened? Did you trip over something? (laughs) And and I said, "Uh, no. I explained to her, you know, that I'm a medium and sometimes they share pain of death. And I said, there's a, there there was a man here. He tells me his name is Jimmy or James. And he was shot in the back because he cheated at cards right there at that poker table. And he was trying to run out the door. And she said, yeah, we have confirmation that there's a man who died being shot in the back, the lower back right there at that spot Mm -hmm. because he cheated at cards. So, uh, you know, I had to tell the guy, I had to tell Jimmy or James, uh, you know, please, it's okay to stop sharing your pain of death. <laughs> get it. I told your story. <laughs> oh, and did he, did he respect that? Well, yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> so he did, he stopped, well, he stopped sharing it, but um, it took about, honestly, it was such a painful experience. It actually took about maybe seven minutes to go away at, yeah. at, as I started going back up the stairs. 
and um, my, my friends were like, um, are you okay? I'm like, yeah, it, you know, it's the dead guy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Well, that's, uh, yeah, that would be because you feel the physical, the physical yeah. pain of it. Yeah. And we have to remember, too, that when we go in these places, these are people that there's, they may not, you may not be able to see them, but they still, they're still people and mm -hmm. they still maintain their personalities. And obviously, if this guy was brave enough to, to cheat at cards, um, you know, he was a pretty strong, gruff personality. So, you know, I may have asked him if he could stop sharing the pain of death. And he was like, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll wait five, seven minutes that you're upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> Give you time to recoup before we do this again. All right. Yeah, yeah he's a tough guy. <laughs> all right. Well, we are um, running up to the hour. So before we do that, I, I uh, warned you before we started recording that I would have some random questions for you here at the end. Okay. And then uh, and then we'll close it out. So Perfect. first first question for you. So you have said that ghosts choose to dwell in places that they died that they loved or lived in if you mm -hmm. had to be a ghost i i don't know how but that's that's just the scenario you had to be a ghost where would you choose to dwell um probably an animal shelter because they can see and and hear ghosts and spirits mm -hmm. and uh it would be surrounded by love and i would constantly assure them that things are okay on the other side if they don't get adopted Oh, oh, that touches my heart. <laughs> <laughs> All right. A uh, medium question for you. For someone listening who uh, may just be waking up to their own mediumistic abilities, what is mm -hmm. the most important thing you could tell them to keep in mind as they go through the motions? Trust your feelings. Trust what you hear. Trust what you feel. It's easy to doubt yourself. I still do pet readings every every weekend and I doubt myself and I, they come back with confirmations for everything, every weird, crazy <laughs> thing. Mm -hmm. um, and it, test yourself. Um, you can go to a historic mansion like I did. This is how I decided that my, discovered that my abilities were actually true. See what you get and then talk to the house historian or the tour guide and see if that kind of a person lived there at any time. Oh, well, that's that's good advice. Um, yeah, that's really good advice. Like if you need that confirmation, there, there's ways to get it, too. But I, I love yeah. that. Trust, trust yourself. Do it in life, too, folks. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Final question. And I, I'm so excited to, to talk about this. I remember the first time we talked, um, it had crossed my mind. I wanted to ask you about darker entities um, and it mm -hmm. just wasn't appropriate at the time. But you did mention or you, you talked about demons in uh, one of the books today um, mm -hmm. and uh, w what you said about them really piqued my interest what are your thoughts as to what these entities actually are well i base my uh my thoughts from really my scientific perspective so as a scientist uh, i know that we have uh we meaning well nasa has discovered uh, 5,000 exoplanets, that is planets that are outside of our solar system. Mm -hmm. And that said, there are many that are in what's called the Goldilocks zone or the habitable zone that will support life. It also, we've also found water on different moons in our solar system. Um, so, and water really is the hallmark of life. So that said, there's life from other solar systems. Absolutely. Uh, and there are, there are another, I think, 8,000 uncatalogued <laughs> planets, exoplanets. Mm -hmm. That's a lot. And that's only what we can see. We're just a speck. So that said, when, when these entities die, they also have their energy with memories, personality, and knowledge of their life. And as a spirit, they can go anywhere, anytime, anyplace. We can too. Uh, we can go fly to Neptune if we want as an energy entity once we pass. Mm -hmm. um, or... Alpha Centauri. And I think that that's what happens with these. These are actually just living things from another universe. When they see us, they may act as a, uh, a an animal that's cornered, if you will, and they go on the offensive. Okay. So we are just misinterpreting what we are seeing. I think so. I, I mean, and they're, you know, obviously we look weird to them. 
<laughs> we probably look terrifying to them. Right. Um, but, th you know, there, there are also probably things that never actually uh, took a physical form that may be energy. And, and those things I, I don't know anything about, but I, I can also see those things behaving uh, in an ad adversarial way, too. It's more about defense. It's more about self-defense with these, with these what people call demons. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, okay. Quick follow-up question: What What do you think about like the stereotypical theological definition of the entity? Is it just all hogwash? Well, I wouldn't throw anybody's religion under the bus, but uh, you know, everybody is entitled to believe what they want. But but I, I believe that you know, I, as someone who tries to be educating myself every day. Religions are all man-made. We were, mm -hmm. They were all conceived by man. You know, if I had my pick of religions, I, heck, I would pick the Greek gods because they're hot. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh -huh. So uh, you can you can call them what you will. Yeah. Um, and my other related to a religion, my experience is that every spirit that I've talked to on the other side says there is no hell. Mm -hmm. Hell is being trapped as an earthbound ghost for eternity with no one able to hear you and help you. True, very true. Wow, well, we, uh, boy, we, we are right at the hour here. So uh, we went, we, we talked about a lot of things I wasn't expecting to talk about. <laughs> so uh, before we wrap up, uh, where can people connect with you? Where can they buy Ghosts of England and Ghosts of the Birdcage Theater? They can connect with me at robgutrow.com or if you can't spell my, crazy last name it's petspirits.com <laughs> so and you'll you'll find my blog there that I have a blog every week um, my webpage how to get animal readings pet readings um, and um, at all my events and everything and I'm on Facebook Twitter Instagram all that stuff that you have to be on um, and they can find my books at amazon.com ebook or paperback and Kristen I always try to because I'm self-published I price them below $10 because I want people to read them. I want people to educate themselves and understand what happens on the other side based on my experiences. Wonderful. And I certainly appreciate <laughs> the price as, as a podcaster who buys, you know, all, all of my guest books. I want to read them. Um, I, I sincerely appreciate um, and I appreciate the education as well. Are those also available through robgutrow.com as well, or, or would you rather people just go to the Amazon page? They're all uh, on Amazon. Yeah. Okay. okay. No, I don't sell them directly. I, I would rather people get them from Amazon and get them delivered quickly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. And before we wrap it all up, do you have any final thoughts, words of wisdom, pieces of advice you would like to leave with my audience? Number one, believe in yourself. Number two, uh, if you are sensitive, believe what you feel. Number three, if you encounter anything that's paranormal, remember that they were once living, breathing people or pets at one time, and they all need to be treated with respect. And number four, um, spirits on the other side, whether people or pets, always want us to live our life to the fullest, to enjoy our time in the physical, and they will all be waiting for us on the other side. Rob Guttrow, it has been an absolute pleasure to have you back on the show. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kristen. It's been my pleasure. Thank you to Rob Guttrow for being my guest once again. There are so many more awesome stories and experiences he shares in the books we discussed today, so definitely pick up copies for yourself. Rob also joined me backstage on the Patreon for a quick chat about the afterlife, what other mediums won't tell you about it, reincarnation, and what his upcoming book, Pets in the Afterlife 4, is all about. If you have been keen to watch any of the video versions of these interviews, you've been waiting since I announced I was going to start uploading them on the last episode, I have some temporary bad news, folks. A couple of days ago, a piece of my ceiling came loose and fell right onto my open laptop. My life especially centers around this show, and this show especially centers around this expensive piece of technological wizardry. Suffice it to say, my life flashed before my eyes as my computer's life flashed 
before its eyes as the literal sky fell onto it. Obviously, it is still operating in some sense as you are hearing me now and this episode that I was able to edit since then. But it's been a trying couple of days, as you might imagine, as I continue to discover the programs that just now no longer work. Hooray! I cannot open any video files. Double hooray! Ah, podcaster problems. I'll figure it out. I always do. But yes, that is why those videos are not up yet. Hey, you want to hear some good news? Paranormal investigator Hannah B. joins me for this week's bonus episode. I know how y'all loved her last time, so had to have her back on. Had to. Leaving you guys with that little nugget to look forward to. Fridays aren't just for pizza, for our hot lunches, or wearing your pajamas to work day. No, they're for bonus episodes featuring Hannah from Spooky Bee Paranormal. So we'll see you all back here at the end of the week. Until then, stay safe, keep the nightlight on, and sleep with one eye open.